you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. With his latest book, Monsters of the Tar Heel State, David Weatherly has again brought us another fantastic collection of cryptids, legends and witness encounters from across North Carolina. My first introduction into the strange cryptids of North Carolina was discovering the story of the infamous Beast of Bladenborough through a Monster Quest episode that covered a spate of modern encounters around the town of Bolivia just after the turn of the century, which parallels the Bladenborough case. North Carolina certainly seems to be the stomping ground for something that likes to take domestic animals of all shapes and sizes every few years. Also on this episode of Mysteries and Monsters, we will dive into the mysterious Black Panthers of the Carolinas, another creature dismissed as either misidentification, bobcats, or even labradors. Can hundreds of witnesses really all be wrong? For some, the number of Bigfoot encounters in the Tar Heel State may also be surprising, yet the reports go all the way back to the days of the Cherokee. We meet Nobby, the local Bigfoot, dearly loved by the residents. Michael Green, a man who allegedly caught thermal footage of a Bigfoot. And the curious case of Casey Hathaway and the bear that allegedly saved his life. A big thank you as always to David for his time, conversation and knowledge. And the links to the Bigfoot footage we mention in the show will be in the show notes. As always, you can support the show by signing up to Patreon in the show notes for $4 a month for early access and bonus content. We're across all social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters YouTube channel and you can find our website at mysteriesandmonsters.com. As always, artwork for the show by my brother, Dean Bestall. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. So, before we join David, let's hear an infamous 911 call regarding one of the sightings of Nobby from a gentleman called Tim Peeler, who the media didn't treat so kindly. Clearly, Tim had had a very chilling experience. I don't know if I should have called this in or not, but... If I had have a camera, I'd take a picture of it. Take a picture of who? I don't know what, I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. I would not kill it because I was afraid to. But he went back up the mountain. Cleveland County 911. Hello. Can I help you? Yes. This is Tim Peeler. Uh-huh. Uh, you probably have my address. Yes, sir. What's going on now? Yeah, I shined a light on this thing. Well, I would not shoot it. Okay, what did it look like? It looked like a giant ape with a man's face. But... I was afraid to kill it, and it made a whistling sound. It was about nine, ten foot tall, with real long arms. I go out there, it gets gone. Now come back in the house, and it gets back there again, and my dogs are just raising heck. Would I get in any trouble if I shot and killed this beast, this animal, or whatever it is? Would I get in any trouble? I, I can't answer that question. If he goes too close to me, I will kill him. To some, North Carolina may not strike you as a hotbed of cryptozoology. Yet, 
you only have to mention the ferocious beast of Bladenborough, or the ubiquitous Nobby to those in the know, and a wry smile may appear. The Tar Heel State is full of many a monster. Once again, David Weatherly joins me to take us on a tour of this underrated area in terms of monsters and legends that go back centuries. David, a warm welcome back as always. How are we? Good day, my friend. It's always good to talk with you. Oh, and likewise, likewise, another wonderful addition to your ever burgeoning <laughs> state cryptid guide for us all around the world. North Carolina is is clearly a state that's that's dear to your heart, David. It it is indeed. I grew up there, and uh, since you've read the book, you know there are a couple of uh, somewhat personal stories in there of things that I experienced, and. You know, it, it's funny because a couple of people have asked me why. You know, why didn't you do this one <laughs> first or, yes. or beforehand? And uh, <laughs> uh, you know, honestly, uh, the series has grown very organically, and you know, as a writer, probably more so with fiction than nonfiction. You know, you have a sense of where things are going. But I've noticed in this series, uh, even though it's nonfiction, it, it kind of. Um, it's, it's taken on its own direction in some ways, mm. and uh, that's what led to the sequence that these things have been released. You know, they've kind of uh, been all over the country so far. You know, I've done something in, in the West. I did Alaska and the Midwest, and, and now I've uh, hit the South with <laughs> North Carolina and didn't do it at first because I wanted to – write it carefully so to speak uh, since there was a personal element and since there are so many different stories uh, in the state you know it's it turned into a pretty thick volume in fact the last honestly the last three have been pretty hefty um, mm. size wise and there comes a point where you know some things just have to be trimmed down you know obviously you could do a whole whole thick book on just Bigfoot sightings in, in almost any given state yes and some of the other stories are extensive, too. But um, North Carolina, uh, of course, has some pretty unique tales like a lot of the states do, like most of the states do. Mm -hmm. And uh, its big one made the cover was the Beast of Bladenboro, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes called the Vampire Beast of Bladenboro. Yes. Uh, but it also covers you know, a range of other things. It covers, of course, Bigfoot sightings, some water legends, and, and a range of other strange things that I have uncovered over the years. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is one of the things about North Carolina, as I, as I referred to in the in the introduction. I think it's one of those that when you realise just some the, the quality of some of the the stories and the monster legends and the encounters from the state, it does surprise me as we were we were speaking before we started the interview, David. That the Beast of Bladenborough is one of those that's that's very well known these days. However. One of the other situations that seems to be going on in North Carolina is the prevalence of Black Panther sightings. And, of course, North Carolina is a state, you know, the, the, the football team is known as the Carolina Panthers. So it's a state that has a has a history of, of Panthers. And yet, once again, we seem to have what would look like hundreds of witnesses who are coming across a creature that allegedly doesn't exist that everybody must be mistaking for bears black labradors <laughs> or anything else that other than a black panther david and as we said on as you were referring to there it's a state very close to your heart as as someone that grew up there are you still surprised whenever we come across this situation that the official line is no you're all wrong you're all seeing things <laughs> well, that's kind of the, you know, sort of the joke at this point, isn't it? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, officially they don't exist, so you must be wrong. And these these accounts uh, of these black panthers in particular, but uh, panthers in general, they crop up in so many states. And you know, obviously in the United States we have mountain lions in the West. Uh, we do have... We do have an eastern big cat. We have the Florida panther, which, mm -hmm. you know, officials say, uh, you know, they're only in 
the southern part of Florida. So I, I don't know if the Florida Panthers got the memo that they're not allowed <laughs> to cross state lines. Mm-hmm. Uh, but apparently it's official, you know, dictate. So yeah. <laughs> they, they can't possibly be anywhere else. Uh-huh. Uh, yet, you know, we get these reports from really all over the country. I, I've, I've encountered this in so many different states. Uh, you hear them out west, you don't think too much about it unless it's something really unusual, like a a black panther or you know a a, a tiger, you know a tiger or a leopard or something like that. But mm. when you come to the uh, to the eastern half of the country and you start hearing these accounts, I, I ran into plenty of them in in the Midwest uh, and all over the South. You hear these accounts in North Carolina, of course. There are, as you stated, hundreds, e- easily hundreds, maybe even thousands, if you start counting for the fact that uh, there are witnesses who have seen these things multiple times. Mm-hmm. There are plenty of people who don't report them because nobody listens, you know, mm-hmm. at least at least no one on the official level. <laughs> and it, uh, it it's somewhat amusing and frustrating at the same time because you know wildlife wildlife officials state officials and so forth say well you know this uh, almost by rote you know they just <laughs> like they're reading from the textbook you know well there are no there are no cougars or panthers in North Carolina you know they're extinct there are there is no such thing as a black panther that's the favorite line that these people uh, spout off and. The thing is, is that uh, they will quickly point out that, you know, there are no documented, quote, black panthers. Uh, now, you'll see some photos if you Google this online, and what you find is that it's typically a jaguar uh, that is black in color, and you can see the patterning on the coat if you look very closely. Uh, this is not... This is not a cougar or, or a North American panther, that solid black that you're seeing in these pictures. Yet, this is what it, countless people are reporting seeing. Hmm. Uh, and I've taught, I've taught to people who were lifelong outdoorsmen, hunters, uh, you know, people who <laughs> know every animal that's found in the wild in the state of North Carolina. And these are not guys who are mistaking a a house cat for something the size of a panther, mm. you know. Or a, and and you hear this handful of explanations from officials, you know. Oh, it was a bear, it was a dog, it was a house cat, and and it's it's laughable, honestly. It is, you know, if you're telling someone with that kind of experience, you know. If it's some tourist driving through from New York who, you know, has, <laughs> has never been out in the mountains and he, and he see, says he saw a black panther, well, you might say, okay, well, <laughs> let's stop and think, you know, and let's, let's consider what's your, your background. But, no, if you're talking about a guy who hunts half of the year every year and has encountered everything you can imagine, he's telling you exactly what he saw, uh, then it becomes pretty fascinating to me. And you say, all right, well, you know, this, these are accounts and sightings with uh, some validity to them. So the, the number of these creatures that people are seeing, it's, it's really off the, off the scale. Um, you know, in, in some portions of western North Carolina, uh, you know, you, you hear these reports. If you start listening and know who to talk to, uh, you hear these reports all day. Yeah. Uh, people who spotted them sometimes while they're out hunting, sometimes, you know, when they were just out, you know, sometimes in a national wildlife area, uh, they're all over the place out there. Mm -hmm. And what's the explanation? Well, we're not quite sure. (laughs) Well, we know what the explanation is, David. They're not there. Everybody's (laughs) wrong. Um, I mean, there's a great quote from one of the people that you speak to. I think he's a gentleman called Jim from Asheville. Mm Mm-hmm. Who basically said, "Well, I didn't bother reporting it because I'm I'm sick to death of people telling me that I don't know what I'm looking at." Right. And that seems <laughs> to be the general thing, as you refer to, when you get people who have spent their entire lives in the woods hunting, either for sport or working in that field in regards to population control, David, for whatever reason, I find it incredible that these people are completely dismissed out of hand, as if. These people have no ability to understand what they're looking at. And you wonder, if these people are so bad at 
at recognizing animals how on earth have they managed to make a living out of this <laughs> right yeah yeah well you know you go into the rural areas of the state and you find people who you know they hunt for assessments uh and and have for generations so these people you know they know what they're doing they know how to track animals they they you know understand and recognize the signs uh, but when it comes to officials then it's a whole different ball game because uh you know a lot of these a lot of these bureaucrats they just don't want to they don't want to address the idea they don't want to be the crackpot to a certain degree because you know who wants to be the the single wildlife official who comes to his boss and says, "Hey, you know what? I think we got black panthers out in uh, <laughs> in, in the mountains in in North Carolina. Uh, they're you know they're going to laugh him out of the office, or they're going to you know at, at worst maybe you know demote him or fire him or something like that because it's not acceptable mm. because there's not an excuse or a reason. And you know honestly, it's hard to it's hard to pin down exactly what the reasoning is behind that. I, I think to a certain degree, some people just don't like the idea of change on an official level and the implications that something like that brings. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, in some ways it's similar to acknowledging Bigfoot. Uh, okay, we're going to acknowledge this animal, this creature that people have been claiming encounters and sightings of for, for decades. Uh, so what does that mean on a, on a governmental level? You know, are we going to regulate it? Are we going to list it as endangered? You know, what what does it mean? What is it going to do? Uh, and it, it's it's the very idea, I think, somewhat sends shockwaves across the bureaucratic levels, so to speak. And that in itself is is uh, <laughs> you know probably bothersome to them because let's face it, a lot of people are, are lazy; they don't want the additional work, uh, <laughs> and and a lot of people don't want to take responsibility. You know, as I, I noted a moment ago, who, who wants to be that guy? Yeah. You know, who says, "Wait a minute, here we 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 really need to look at this uh, because it's it's just it carries so many implications with it." Yeah. Well, I know many people from all over the US, regardless of which state, wherever this situation turns up, David, there seems to be two trains of thought. One is they don't want the official or the officials don't want to recognize it because we're talking legislation and protection and certain areas may become fenced off from the public and basically stop you're going to be stopped from entering these areas you may have gone into for generations and then the other aspect of course is a financial burden on the state because these would be a remarkable discovery under any circumstances so i know a lot of people who believe that the officials are just ignoring it until something happens that they can't just dismiss it anymore i just quite happily just denying it filibusting people about it and just moving on and, and just telling everybody that they're completely wrong well that's exactly what it is and you know the funny thing is is if you if you sort of reverse the whole concept and you say what well, you know if you just think for a moment what would it be like if they suddenly announced that uh, you know some particular animal doesn't exist anymore mm -hmm. you know let's say you know, the bobcat for comparison, you know, bobcats are, are all around in the south or in North Carolina. Uh, but, you know, how often are bobcats seen? Uh, they're, you know, they're solitary creatures. That, you know, they typically um, hunt small prey and, you know, they try to avoid people. Uh, mm -hmm. But what if all of a sudden the officials started, you know, saying to anyone who saw a bobcat, well, no, that, that, you didn't see a bobcat. That was uh, that was a chihuahua, you know, or, or <laughs> something. And yeah. You know, it's it's just as absurd to mm -hmm. think about that, isn't it? So, you know, really, this is what we have going on. We have, you know, vast numbers of people. If you if you go, if you widen the scope beyond North Carolina, you, you easily have thousands of people mm -hmm. who have reported seeing black panthers. Can all of them be wrong? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, are all of them mistakenly seeing, you know, the neighbor's house cat and thinking it's a <laughs> it's a panther? Come on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just how popular are black Labradors in North Carolina, David? <laughs> how popular? Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, it is 
it is somewhat absurd you know, mm. when you start looking at it from different angles. And uh, you definitely get the sense that, you know, this is something that officials, they just don't want to deal with it. And I, I honestly don't think they ever will until they're forced to, you know, until somebody rolls into some small little town with a, you know, a bona fide Black Panther that they've shot or caught or, or found, you know, mm. somewhere. And, uh you know, they say here, here it is. How do we explain this? Yeah, absolutely. I think it, for me as well, a, a, a prime example of a of a similar creature is is the wolverine because wolverines are very reclusive, hardly mm-hmm. ever caught on film, as far as I'm aware, David. And yet, we're fully aware that wolverines exist. But how many times have people actually seen them? I mean, I can't think of more than a handful of people that I've ever seen interviewed or discussed the Wolverine seeing one in in real life so once again we're dealing about a species of animal cat that are known for being sneaky reclusive shy away from human contact Um, and North Carolina along with many other states has wonderful ranges of, of forest and woodland which would be easy for anything to just disappear into Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And as you refer to there, you mentioned bobcats, um, which I think is a, is a good lead <laughs> to the <laughs> next case that we need to, to discuss, because there's a little bit of mystery cat attached to this, depending on how much you look into it. Um, and that's the infamous case of the Beast of Bladenborough, which appears one of those wonderful stories where something just appears from absolutely nowhere to terrorize a a small town which even in this modern era david i think the population's essentially just doubled it's not much it's less than two thousand i believe and it's a very small town (laughs) yeah i mean it'd be a big village here in the uk (laughs) that would be pushing it um (laughs) so once again you've got a wonderful situation where we've got all the ingredients of witnesses uh monster hunters turning up what on earth is the beast of bladenborough you know there's still not an answer for that paul (laughs) (laughs) no there are opinions (laughs) opinions, obviously uh it's probably you know i i usually try to find a cryptid unique to the state or or at least one that has been uh, cited a lot in that particular state for the cover mm. and uh, it was easy with North Carolina uh, yeah. because the Beast of Bladenborough legend and this is a story I tell you it's got so many of the the right elements you know for just a, a crazy story mm-hmm. uh, it starts actually in 1953 And a lot of people don't realize this, but the first sighting of what is believed to to be the creature occurred uh, not in Bladenboro, but in a small town called Clarkton. Clarkton's about, uh, it's just under 10 miles, it's it's like about nine miles from Bladenboro. And uh, it was just just after Christmas, it was December 29th, excuse me, um, and a woman was alerted to something going on outside because her dogs were uh, barking and, and making a lot of noise, and she, she decided to go out and see, you know, what was going on. Mm-hmm. She stepped out and saw what she described as a very large... <laughs> cat-like black animal <laughs> love that. Uh, that was uh, about five feet long hmm. and she said that when she spotted this creature it, it quickly fled into the woods so things were quiet for a couple of days and then New Year's Eve on December 31st a gentleman in Bladenboro has an incident um, where his he, his dogs are attacked on the farm, and uh, this is a, a brutal attack. He he goes out and he he's very distraught to find that his his animals have just been uh, kind of torn up, and um, he said that it, it was just you know a, a horrible scene. It was clear that it'd been a, a vicious battle. It was. Uh, it was late in the evening, somewhere around 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and 
the weird thing in this incident is that uh, the gentleman's father wrapped one of the dogs up in a blanket mm. and <laughs> later on at some point this creature whatever it is they didn't they didn't see the creature at this point uh, whatever the thing was it came back and retrieved that dog uh, so it shows up again sometime in the early morning hours and and it kills the other animal and uh, this sort of this is sort of the flashpoint because the, the gentleman of course reports the incident and uh, very quickly, there's another attack the following day, January 1st. Uh, another another fellow uh, reports an attack at his farm. And this time, the story takes a little bit of a turn because he claims that the animals uh, were drained of blood. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're talking the 1950s. And, of course, looking at this in modern times, you know, you can't help, when you start reading these reports, you can't help but start thinking, gosh, this sounds almost like Chupacabra or something, yeah. uh, you know, because of the, the strange nature of it. But the attacks are, are very vicious, and they continue. So over the following days, other dogs are attacked around Bladenboro, hmm. and the police chief gets involved. Now, the police chief kind of fans the flames a little bit because... He reports that the animals are drained of blood, yeah. and he has um, he has a vet look at the animals, and they're trying to determine what kind of creature has attacked these these poor dogs. The police chief is, is not really interested in, in waiting to find out what he's dealing with. He gets some guys together, and he goes out to try to hunt this animal down. Well, it gets even more. Um, <laughs> Dramatic, shall we say, because by <laughs> the 4th of the month, uh, the newspaper in Wilmington catches wind of the story, and they report it. The other media sources jump on it. Now, at this point, no one really knows how media got wind of this this account. You know, was it that slow of a news day that they had to get something out of Blakenboro? Uh, <laughs> you know, it, Hard, hard to say when you look at the early parts of the story, but uh, <laughs> what happens is the accounts start cropping up um, very quickly over a series of days. There are more attacks. There are more witnesses who spot this creature. Now, the problem is everybody seems to describe it slightly different. Yes. Some say it looks like an, uh, a lion. Some say it looks like a, a uh, panther. Uh, some people describe this bizarre sort of combination of different things. You know, no one really seems to have a solid idea of what they're dealing with. Although in most accounts, it does indicate that it's some kind of a large cat-like creature. Then people start reporting that they're hearing this thing, uh, making these weird screeching noises uh, coming from an area just outside of town. Hmm. The the police chief continues to try to track this animal down. There are incidents that occur when the when the hunting parties are going out looking for this thing, but because of news sources getting hold of the story and spreading it far and wide, <laughs> other hunters start showing up. So here we've got you know the <laughs> early 1954. We basically have monster hunters rolling into town. <laughs> now, uh, you know, maybe they wouldn't have called themselves that at the time, of course, but they were after, you know, what was quickly being called the Beast of Bladenboro. Mm. And at one point, while the, uh, the number of hunters grew over the course of a few days uh, to just a, a crazy number. We're talking about, uh, first of all, Bladenboro is a very small town. In 1954, the population was, oh, it was just under 800 people. Hmm. Okay. Um, so <laughs> by the first week, uh, there were, by many accounts, about a thousand hunters <laughs> in town yeah. looking for the beast of Bladenboro. Residents said that they were afraid to go outside mm. because, you know, picture the scene, night falls, 
And your little town of, of less than 800 people now has a thousand men roaming around with guns, mm. ready to take a, a shot at anything that moves <laughs> in the dark, anything that they think might be the beast. Mm. So people were becoming terrified for a whole new reason now. And it was that, you know, they were afraid of being shot by accident. These guys would, would roam. There was a, a, there was a swampy area outside of Bladenboro. They were wandering through the swamp trying to track this thing down. Uh, they had hunting dogs with them. Uh, they all had an opinion on what it was, you know. They were speculating it was a, a panther, um, a wild dog, a coyote. There were all these crazy stories that come into the mix. And, of course, we don't have time to go through all of them today. Yes. But, you know, there were a few crazy ones that came in in the midst of it. There was a claim that uh, one gentleman stepped in and said, oh, I know what the beast is. It's a, it's a German shepherd. Uh, it's a mixed breed German Shepherd that I used to have that I called Big Boy, and I, you know, I gave him away because he was too fierce. And, yes. You know. Then there's these other stories that crop in. Well, at the height of it, uh, <laughs> the town mayor, Mayor Fussell, brings in uh, Fussell. Incidentally, coincidentally, also owns the local theater. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he brings in a movie called The Big Cat. <laughs> that was, uh, you know, it's this old West movie about this cat that's on, you know, this mountain lion that's on the loose. And it just, it, it gets really somewhat insane. And, um, you know, when you hear these tales, it, you get the sense that this drug on for a long time. But really... Really, the frenzy only lasted uh, a brief time. It lasted for uh, all total, you know, probably less than three weeks because by the by the middle of January, they're um, talking about potential, you know, explanations for uh, the beast, you know, to describe what it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, along the way, the the mayor is now getting concerned, as is the police chief, uh, that the situation in in town is just out of control. Yeah. So the the mayor takes advantage (laughs) one day because a a gentleman rolls into town and says that he's he's killed the the beast, and it's a bobcat. (laughs) And... They take this poor bobcat, and uh, Mayor Fussell, you know, announces the the beast is, you know, we've called the beast. Mm. Uh, he is, and they they take this bobcat and string it up on a flagpole in town center, and put a sign under it. This is the beast of Bladenboro. Yeah. Now they do this in order to to call off the the hunt essentially and to get rid of people. Uh, so after that, the hunters start trickling out of town and, and things slowly return to normal. Uh, however, there are reports that crop up after that and they're quickly kind of shut down and say, no, 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 that's not, you know, that, that's not the beast. We, we killed the beast. It's all over. Hmm. In hindsight, when you look at the, the entire thing, you find some interesting points to the story. First of all, uh, Fossil, it turns out, was the one who contacted the media. <laughs> to get them to the story. Obviously, he was hoping to get some attention uh, for the town and, you know, some some good publicity and, you know, hoped it would help tourism or, or whatever. Well, it certainly did that for a couple of weeks there. <laughs> Probably not quite in the way he expected. Uh, I suspect he also made a, a nice profit at the time of uh, from airing the big cat uh, mm. in a movie. But uh, otherwise, the... The, the atmosphere had just become so carnival-like, you know, and just so frenzied that they really had no choice uh, to, but to shut the thing down somehow, some way. And that's what they did hmm. uh, by claiming, oh, no, it's just, you know, it's all over. It was just a bobcat, and uh, it's done. So that was the, that was the main portion of the Beast of Bladenboro story. Of course, its legacy, you know, continues even today because there's uh, still a festival that takes place in the town 
Uh, it's called, uh, you know, it's named after the beast. And uh, I was just, in fact, I was just in Bladenboro a few weeks ago, and uh, people still still talk about it. And, you know, they still remember the attacks. Of course, this is it's not too far back in history, so there are still people who were alive at the time and remember the incidents and remember the craziness that was going on and, and, and also remember that there were attacks afterward uh, that have cropped up on occasion. And, you know, you talk to pretty much anybody uh, in in Bladenboro today and they'll say, yeah, well, that, you know, that bobcat that they brought in in the middle of January was not the beast. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the striking things about this whole scenario, primarily fossils claim that the bobcat was responsible, is that I don't think that anybody described seeing anything that looked like a bobcat in the first place, David. No. <laughs> no, not at all. And it was you know, it was a swamp uh, that this guy, this gentleman uh, the, caught the bobcat in. Uh, he actually nabbed it in a steel trap that he had set in the swamp. And uh, this was, you know, was a couple miles from the city. Obviously, you know, there were bobcats in in the swamp area, but uh, no one, as you said, no one had described this thing as being a bobcat. Uh, everyone said it was much larger uh, and, and much different in appearance. Once again, it's one of those convenient solutions, it seems, David, that whenever we get a weird case like this, I mean, the only thing I was kind of expecting was someone would say, oh, well, you know, we had that circus train crash around here the other year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One of one of the lions escaped or something because that once again is one of those that, that's wheeled out in a couple of other um, weird incidents in the state as well where people say oh yeah there's 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 been an accident and it's just one of those and yet as you refer to it seems as though they just ignored what happened afterwards because there were a few other incidents and a few other animals were were taken and killed and it's almost as if they didn't want it to be continuing at all as far as they were concerned as far as the town was concerned you know you've got a thousand gun-toting visitors um i know you refer to it in the book that a, a group of university students turn up with guns because they yeah. because they want the beast's head for their their wall yeah <laughs> mm. so Clearly, it had caught the imagination because I would imagine people were coming from out of state, you know, coming up from South Carolina and Georgia and, and in from the other states as well, just to try and get a piece of the action, it would seem. And, and it's one of those where it seems to be one of the first modern monster hunts, David, as well in, in American history. It's definitely an early one. Uh, you know, we had a lot of these that cropped up in uh, the 70s. Mm. Uh, with various uh, sightings. I, I covered several of those, of course, in the Indiana book. And uh, in other areas of the country, we've periodically had some of these types of cases. Mm. Uh, but uh, this this one definitely was an early one, uh, you know, 1954. And it wasn't as, uh, obviously it wasn't a period when everybody was talking about Bigfoot or things like that. So this was, this was somewhat of a unique thing. And there was, you know, for most people there were, um, tangible things they could look at to say, wow, this is, you know, this is definitely uh, some kind of creature. There's there's certainly something going on. Uh, this was not, uh, for instance, a, a set of massive tracks, you know, that just led off into the, the swamp or something. This was a case where there were, um, you know, physical attacks. There were uh, all these animals that had been assaulted. There were multiple witnesses who had claimed they had seen the creature, who, who had heard the creature, hmm. and who had very, uh, fairly distinctive sightings or encounters with the thing. Hmm. So, you know, that uh, that also made it very unique, I think. And, uh, of course, in, in modern times, if something like this was going on, uh, we would probably have the potential to do so much further investigation. You know, we'd, we'd be able to look closer at the the victims to see, you know, what kind of marks or indications or maybe even DNA there was. Uh, but at, at this point, you know, obviously they didn't have that kind of technology. Uh, however, it did certainly catch people's imagination. And, the, again, the media attention, you know, that hyped it 
so much. Um, I, I think it created a situation where many people decided they wanted to be, you know, the guy, the guy yes. who nailed the beast of, of Bladenboro, uh, you know, once and for all and, and uh, had the trophy, so to speak. Uh, but it, that doesn't really happen uh, mm. because, you know, they, they usher in this uh, poor bobcat and they say it's all over, uh, you know get on with things and I, I think that even during the time period a lot of people didn't necessarily believe that but certainly residents wanted the situation to come to a conclusion yeah. uh, because they had valid concerns about what was going on and I think that you know the because the hype was quickly squashed there wasn't really anything for uh, the the so-called monster hunters to feed on, so to speak. You know, there weren't <laughs> new reports. There weren't new reports coming in every day. There weren't, uh, you know, articles popping up in the papers. So they kind of had to let it go in mm. that sense. Yeah, and it seems to be a creature that has this kind of hold over the area because, as we were discussing off air, David, my introduction to the Beast of Bladenborough is a is an episode of Monster Quest from about two thousand and nine where it seemed that a very similar set of circumstances were occurring uh, in the town of Bolivia, which I believe is also in, in the area. Not not close, mm -hmm. but close enough. Um, and once again, that seems to be one of those situations where people living in the areas were having their dogs taken. You know, when we're talking about pit bulls and Alsatians, these are not what you would consider the kind of dog that would be easily taken by any kind of creature. Because um, I know often they say, oh, well, it's probably a big dog that's got out that's quite ferocious, and it's that that's killing it. But the same with the Beast of Bladenborough. I know there was one particular poor victim, one of the dogs, had essentially been decapitated by whatever it was, which is a, which right. is a remarkable injury for a dog to sustain under any circumstances. And I'm not aware of a situation where dogs fighting ones ended up being decapitated, David, even if it's a rabid one. No, no, I've, I've never heard of such a thing either. There, there definitely is, you know, I do a whole section in, in the book called Legacy of the Beast because mm. uh, there are cases that have cropped up. After that, in in, uh, in the years just after the initial Beast of Bladenboro frenzy, there were some other accounts that um, certainly sound just like the creature, whatever it is that we're dealing with. But then when you sort of fast forward, you know, quite a few years and, and go even into the early 2000s, mm -hmm. you have these accounts that pop up. There were a series of attacks around uh, Ashboro in 2004, I think, and then a few years beyond that is, is the incident you're referring to around 2007 there was a whole wave of attacks in, in Bolivia now mm -hmm. that's about an hour uh, south southeast of Bladenboro so we're still in the same general region and certainly for a big cat uh, you know we're, we're certainly in the same uh, the, the same space and I'm not saying it's the same animal because that's a lot of years in between but uh, what you do have is, is an intriguing pattern uh, when you have something that shows up in the same region uh, attacking in the same manner. Huh? Uh, so there were a whole series of, of attacks uh, that lasted around Bolivia. Brief time, and then whatever the thing was, it just kind of mysteriously disappeared. Yeah. Uh, at that point, you know, they found some, some various... Um, tracks and uh, some different animals, not just dogs, some different farm animals were attacked. Mm -hmm. uh, but just like the Bladenboro incident, it was never really any solid conclusion to the thing. Uh, curiously enough, it it uh, cropped up a few years after that, because I think it was 20, 2012 or 2013 in that range, uh, there were other attacks mm -hmm. in the area. And... You know, this is uh, this is something that, of course, the officials say. You know, oh no, it's just you know, it's, it's a dog attack, or it's this or that. And really, these are consistently unexplained attacks. And now, they do appear to be, to me, to be some kind of a, a large cat. And interesting enough, just like we were talking about at the beginning of the program, we may be circling back around to this idea <laughs> of panthers. Yeah. Well, I was going to say it's clearly a black panther, David. Right, yeah. <laughs> which which doesn't exist, so the whole thing is, is you know, imagination. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, I mean, and once again, like I say, as as with the original incident in the fifties and the and the other ones, because I know the, I think is the one in the sixties where it's pigs that you know rather large hogs that get taken down, um, yeah. and then you have uh, reoccurring flaps. And they're all all very short periods as well, like you say about Bladenborough. It's a very short period of time, which is a typical cryptid flap as well, David. Regardless of what kind of creature, we occasionally come across these stories where something seems to happen over a three to six week period, and then just disappears into the ether again, into the into the swamps of mystery, wherever it may be. Right. And this just seems to happen every sort of 10 to 15 years in this particular area. Like you say, in different, you know, maybe 100 miles away or whatever, but there certainly seems to be some kind of area that is attracting something that likes to take down domesticated animals of of, of a variety of types. Yeah, a- absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, if you, you kind of have to look at it, uh, if you really want to get to the bottom of it, I, I think you have to strip away some of the hype that surrounded it. And even, even modern representations, of course, they, they push the more, oh, um, <laughs> What's the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, they push things like oh, it's the vampire beast. Yes, and, <laughs> you know, more sensational uh, aspects. So I think I think Monster Quest when they covered even covered it even called it the vampire beast. Yes, uh, but if I recall recall correctly, they also came back around to the idea of a, a cougar hmm. uh, being the culprit. And really, when you when you take away some of the hype and look at the bare facts, I think that that's what we're dealing with. So uh, once again, the imaginary Black Panthers are striking, but this time they're, they're doing a great deal of physical damage. Yeah, yeah, because I remember in that episode as well, I think they played some big cat recordings to one of the witnesses who'd heard it when he was sat on his porch. And I mm-hmm. think he identified a lion. Which is is one of those things that I know you touch on in the book as well, that North Carolina is one of those states where they've got a secret big cat population of exotic pets. Yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised how many how many places in the U.S. actually has that, you know, these, mm-hmm. these illegal uh, exotic pets. And, of course, uh, I, I think that a lot of explanation, I think a lot of these accounts that pop up around the country, the explanation is uh, exotic pet owners who let them go uh, because they, they quickly realize one, how how large these animals become and two, how much it costs to feed them because if I'm remembering correctly uh, you know, a tiger eats something like what is it, 50 pounds of raw meat a day or something, it, it's, <laughs> it's kind of mind-boggling and really I mean, you think about the size of a big cat, yeah. uh, you know and in comparison to, you know, a small domestic cat, well, you, what a a tin of food a day, right? And so proportionately, mm-hmm. uh, when you carry that up and think, well, you know, this is a massive cat. <laughs> it needs a lot of, a lot of uh, protein, a lot of food. So yeah, you know, you're talking about. You imagine what that would cost at this point in, in time to feed one of those things. Yeah. So you know, people are letting these animals go and turning them loose in the wild, and uh, hence we get these random reports of people seeing lions and tigers and, and such wandering around the country. Remarkable. I mean, it is a mystery that continues to confound us, like you say. I mean, what are we, nearly 70 years on? And people mm-hmm. are still talking about this weird creature. Um, whatever it was, wherever it came from, and wherever it went, um, it, it seems to enjoy just popping back up just to sort of remind people that, you know, I'm not gone just quite yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and one of the other aspects of North Carolina, which I think may surprise some people if if they're not too deep into the world of Sasquatch and Bigfoot, David, is that North Carolina has a a long tradition, going back centuries back to the, the Cherokee, of stories of hairy men and, and giants and races of strange creatures living in the in the hills and the woods around them. And I think unless you know an, a lot about Bigfoot or you've read a lot because I know it's one of those states that even caught the attention of, of people like John Green back in the 60s and 70s when he was looking into some of the reports are you surprised that more people aren't aware just how prevalent stories about Bigfoot or Swamp Apes stories are in North Carolina? You know, I'm not surprised simply because uh, I've realized over the years that uh, when you talk about 
Sasquatch. Uh, if, certainly, if you if you go back and kind of not think about the past ten years with all the television and you know shows like Finding Bigfoot and things like that, if you go back prior to that, hmm. uh, people just were not that aware of how widespread these creatures are. Uh, hmm. You know, you would say Bigfoot, and most people would think, oh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, you know, the the Himalayan Yeti. Uh, you know, you've got a few isolated things. Maybe, maybe the Skunk Cape in Florida, uh, and and then occasionally a few other areas would would crop up because so much work was being done. For instance, in Ohio, uh, mm. you know, and, and some regions in the north. But uh, even today, you know, a lot of modern researchers, uh, unless they've studied it extensively and, and read extensively, um, they're surprised when they start understanding that there's so many of these accounts in, in states all over the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, this was, I, I had someone talk to me about the, the Indiana book, and they told me they were shocked that there were so many Bigfoot sightings in mm-hmm. Indiana. And I said, yeah, I said, you know, that's, there are so many accounts. I mean, easily I, I could have done probably a couple of volumes just of Bigfoot encounters in Indiana. Mm-hmm. And in, in some ways the same is true in North Carolina. Now, North Carolina, you know, it's it's a little bit different. People don't, um, unless they're familiar with the state, they don't understand that it, it's kind of divided. You know, you have the western half of the state, which is very mountainous and has a lot of um, <clears throat> a lot of forest and, and a lot of uh, regions that are more rural. Uh, whereas with the kind of the middle of the state to the east, you have, of course, the larger cities. You know, Raleigh, Raleigh, Durham, and then you've got uh, the coastline. So the thing is is that there are so many pockets around the state that are just prime territory for these creatures. Uh, The the Great Dismal Swamp, Mm -hmm. the the mountains in the west that, uh, you know, (laughs) are just so rich in uh, territory that that doesn't see humans trouncing across it every day. you take a drive right there, and you quickly understand, wow, yeah, <laughs> there could easily be tons of these things hiding back here. <laughs> and as you said, the you know the traditions go far back uh, to the Cherokee, uh, who talked about them, uh, all the way up into uh, early period of settlement. And then you've got some legends that have stuck around, like Judah Kula, uh, and then, of course, all the way up into the 70s, when there was another whole string of monster sightings uh, in North Carolina, and that was uh, all centered around a creature called Nobby. Yeah. He's one of my favorite cases in re- in the world of Bigfoot, David, because primarily one of the best things about the whole Nobby, once again, it's over a short period of time, six months or so, is one of the prime witnesses is a gentleman called Forrest Price. And Forrest, I think, got fed up of people either telling him he was he was stupid or he was an idiot and he didn't know what was going on because Forrest was one of those people whose house was completely off the beaten track. I think he said you had to walk nine miles through the woods to get to his house. It was at the end of a dirt track and people were saying, oh, well, it's somebody just having a laugh mucking about. And he's like, well, why on earth would someone come all this way out, start shouting in the woods at three o'clock in the morning? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we... Yeah, we've got a flap in the 70s uh, that, oh, it's from 70, let's see, 78, started in 78 and it went into 79. And it really, uh, it's really kind of interesting because the, the first reported sighting from that particular flap was from an 88 year old lady uh, who. Uh, her name is Minnie. Name was Minnie Cook, <laughs> and uh, you know Minnie is is living all over the country, and she gets up <laughs> early one morning uh, because her uh, once again her dog has alerted her that something's going on, mm-hmm. and uh, she goes out to she goes to look to see what's going on outside, and she sees what she describes as this dark shape uh, in the pasture close to her house is uh, about 50 feet away mm-hmm. and, uh, she just kind of you know stands and watches this thing puzzling over what in the world it is and she's thinking that you know is that a cow is it you know what what is that one well, then it stands up on two legs mm-hmm. um, so uh, 
she now realizes this is a bipedal creature, and uh, it's staring at her. Hmm. Uh, now she she was terrified at the sight of this thing, and uh, afterwards she kept a, a rifle with her anytime she went outside because yes. she was, you know, she didn't want to run into this thing and didn't know what it would do. Hmm. Uh, but the the thing about her sighting is that. It's kind of supported by some other sightings. There was a gentleman who was driving a, a load of wood uh, not too far from Minnie's house, and he spotted this thing. He he thought at first it was a bear hmm. and, uh, because of its size, uh, but he said that it was uh, picking berries off of off of uh, berry bush and eating them. And he said that it, it you know emitted this low growling uh, or this low sound and he you know he was uh, he was not too <laughs> he, was, he was a little bit cautious in the thing too so uh, you know these these stories they quickly grow in this area and again you're talking about the country yeah, yeah that's that's one thing you really have to emphasize at these sites you're talking about a rural area uh, people in these types of areas they're not especially during the time period uh, everyone knows each other they're not this is not a, a prank situation you know, this is not a situation where somebody you know buys a, a bigfoot costume and decides to go have some fun and try to trick you know <laughs> trick somebody uh, this is it's completely different mm-hmm. and uh, the the accounts they quickly flow in. You know, there's a, a pair of sisters who are driving uh, in the area in, in the following January. They spot this creature. Hmm. Uh, uh, it's it's consistently seen around the area. The, there's a hunter who spots it. Now he's he gave a good description of it because he said that it was uh, somewhere around six and a half feet tall and about 300 pounds. Hmm. Uh, he. He described the face, which is interesting because this is where we veer far from from anything that's like a bear. You know, skeptics mm. jump in and say, well, bears can stand up. Well, of course they can. But, uh, you know, these people know what bears look like. And mm. now they're seeing a creature that is, is not a bear. So this gentleman, you know, this hunter, he described the thing and he said that this was definitely not a bear. Um, that it didn't have a snout, that the face was flat. And somewhat human looking, you know, he he was absolutely certain that it wasn't. Now, the funny thing about this guy, Paul, is he was out poaching. Yes, he was. <laughs> and uh, he, he made a comment uh, in the aftermath of this encounter. And he said something to the effect of, I don't know what it was, but I don't intend to go find out. Uh, because and the, whatever this thing is, it's cured me of poaching. Yes. So, <laughs> so he, uh, so he, he mended his ways after his knobby encounter. <laughs> and I mean, that's one of the things as you touch on there, David. People people were told, oh, you're all wrong. Once again, these people have lived here all their lives. Once again, you're all wrong. You're all seeing a bear in January as well, which <laughs> yeah. is, is, an, is an alarm bell anyway. That's you know, sure. Because I know bears do hibernate most of the winter. They will right. appear occasionally, <laughs> won't they? You know, but still... And it's one of those where I've I've seen I've also seen one of those classic excuses whenever a Bigfoot flap occurs that somebody with no evidence goes, Oh well yeah, it was some moonshiners trying to scare oh, yeah. people away and you're like, yeah. Well, how can you scare people away from where they live? <laughs> right. You know? It, it the, the excuses exactly. are often as a dafter explanation than exactly. than some than someone coming forward and being brutally honest and saying, I don't know what's going on. Like as you touch on with Minnie and her <laughs> rifle Minnie has that, that wonderful line where she says, I don't know what it was, but I don't want to see it again. Um, yeah, which, right. You know, yeah. this is an 88-year-old woman. You know, fair play to yeah. her. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and it, it seems that, as we often see in these kind of cases, David, in an area, the locals seem to take Nobby to heart. They They seem to quite like the fact that they've got a Bigfoot knocking about. He seems to become something of a local celebrity to them. Yeah, somewhat. I mean, you go to the region, you know, and you still hear knobby stories. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's uh, occasionally uh, the newspaper will cover, you know, potential knobby sightings. And uh, really, this is a uh, this is a regional 
nickname for Bigfoot, obviously, because that's mm. what you know his people are describing. Uh, but it's it's kind of interesting that, uh, as you say, they sort of took it to heart, and you know people will insist, you know, just leave him alone. Don't you know? Don't mess with him. Yeah, he lives up there. He's up in the woods, and uh, you know he he won't bother you if you don't bother him <laughs> so, so it's a, a very kind of interesting r- regional take on uh, these creatures and uh, a, a very much an accepted reality to many of the folks that live there yeah and I know when I was reading your book how it's it's the reason I became aware of of this Bigfoot in North Carolina Nobby was the uh, the gentleman who the the outdoorsman who lived in the woods um, who essentially ends up phoning the police because he had an encounter and he was worried it was going to kill his dog in about 2010 I think it was oh yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's Tim Peeler. That's it. Yeah, uh, Tim Peeler uh, and his git stick. Which, yeah, which you know, uh, that's in some ways is kind of a tragic act yeah. aspect to that story, just because uh, it, it became uh, the video went viral mm. because it got covered by the news, yeah. and uh, they they sadly poked a great deal of fun at this guy, yeah, because of his. Uh, simplicity, shall we yes. say. You now, he's this old country guy, uh, lives in a very rural area and uh, in, up near uh, South Mountains. Mm. And he he did. He had this bizarre encounter. He, he called the police. The, in fact, the recording of the police call is available. As far as I know, it's still online. You can listen to it. Yeah. And... You have to look at both sides of this thing. I mean, if you if you listen to the call and you think, oh, boy, uh, this guy maybe has been cooking up some moonshine or, you know, something because <laughs> of the way he's talking, you know, you really have to wonder. But then at the same time, you got to understand that this guy was uh, handling a, a what he says is a very bizarre situation as best as he could. Mm-hmm. He claims that this creature that he describes as a, a Sasquatch um, says that it looked like a, a giant ape with a man's face mm-hmm. and that it was out in his yard and he was afraid that it was going to uh, get his dogs. Mm-hmm. So Peeler, uh, he, he wakes up early one morning uh, after hearing coyotes. And he goes outside to check on his, his animals. And when he does, he spots this creature. Mm. Uh, sees it come out of the woods. And he does. He has a he has a walking stick. And he, he said uh, one of the things that's kind of amusing is in the report, and he told reporters this, he says, well, I have a rough talking. <laughs> and I said, you get, get. <laughs> He's, demonstrates how he, you know, put this stick up and poked at this, you know, poked towards this big foot and said, get, you know, get out of here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the police responded to the call and talked to him and, and you know, he, uh, he was honest and, and repeated the story, repeated the story many times in mm-hmm. fact, about what he he had seen uh, it, it became it became sad in that mainstream media caught on to the story it was it was run on gosh like CNN and, and yeah. some of the other news networks and there was a YouTube interview that was put on Peeler and, and uh, it, then it becomes kind of a joke you know yeah. it's, it's not it's not let's listen to what this guy saw what in, you know what in the world was he describing no let's just you know poke fun at how he acts yeah uh, and that's the sad part of it but uh, you know it was interesting in that one of the law enforcement officers that investigated the case said that he recalled the Nobby stories from the 70s mm. and you know he wasn't necessarily sure what to make of it but he was like well you know he's doing his job and he's taking the account mm. uh, so yeah, I mean, people in the area, they, you know, they're kind of, the ones I've talked to are kind of mixed. A lot of them say, no, he, you know, he saw something up there, and, and those things are back up in the mountain, and uh, yeah, that's what he saw. Yeah, absolutely. 
and for me as well, David, like I say, he, he's a very genuine person and he's one of those where being interviewed by mainstream media was probably the worst thing that could have happened for him because he does essentially end up becoming an object of ridicule, which I think is very unfair to him because he didn't have to do this and I think he was just genuinely telling people what had happened to him because it's one of those where you think well he's got nothing to gain from this and I know he was quite frustrated about the the ramifications of this because everybody seemed to to do very well out of his story apart yeah. from him yeah and and he didn't want publicity you know he was really uh, quite quite bothered in the aftermath of the whole thing that um, you know that resulted in so much publicity for mm. him. And there was a later interview that was done by a magazine out of Charlotte, Charlotte Magazine, in fact, mm. um, regional magazine that interviewed him. And, and he said, "Look, it was just something that happened to me, and uh, you know, I was afraid, and I was worried about my dogs, and you know, everybody's made money off of this. I, I just, I just wanted to tell the police and." Uh, and let them know what I saw. You know, mm -hmm. that's really all it was about. Mm -hmm. uh, so you strip away the all the the poking at him and everything, and it's an interesting sighting. Yeah, very much so. Well, the thing about North Carolina experiences, there are two other Bigfoot-related stories I want to touch on, if I may, David. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, is is Michael Green, the former tank commander, which is which is a hell of a resume. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. for for many things once again that's one of those things where I saw the footage and had completely forgot about it until I read your book and I was like of course yeah that is essentially a guy who was who claimed to have had an encounter and didn't have a camera on him and became so convinced by what was happened he was determined to get footage of it and he ended up setting up a, a lure to, to try and film it and allegedly caught something coming in to help itself to a, a candy bar i think he'd, he'd set up or something wasn't it mm -hmm. yeah yeah he caught um he caught some interesting footage you know it's uh, one of those that really made the rounds the guy as you said has had a heck of a resume mm -hmm. and um he he was so determined after a personal sighting of uh, a sasquatch that he kind of dedicated himself to trying to get further evidence mm -hmm. and um, it, you know it's it's weird that nothing more has really come from that um, you know in in the aftermath it's uh, it's certainly an area that is uh, high in the number of sightings uh, he captured the the footage back in Oh gosh, two two thousand nine, mm. and uh, it's on it's on thermal. Yeah, so the thermal imaging, and what it shows is a uh, a humanoid image that uh, you know it's just as if you've seen thermal imaging, you know what these kind of things kind of look like. So this uh, what appears to be this very large figure uh, comes out. From uh, from the trees and reaches out and, and grabs this bait that Green had left and it this was a candy bar mm -hmm. and uh, you know a lot of a lot of other researchers have been very impressed uh, with the footage I, I think it's pretty fascinating mm -hmm. and uh, you know Green himself I mean even he he did an interview after capturing the footage and he said you know I really don't care if anybody believes this or not. I, I know what I saw, and, uh, you know, <laughs> I know what I, I captured, and, um, you know, here it is. And, <laughs> you know, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. I tell you, he put in a lot of time, though, because he was constantly going out mm. and, and researching the creature. And uh, as you noted, his resume, my gosh, he was a... He was a uh, tank commander in the U.S. Army. He was a, um, what was he? He was a, a fraud investigator. Yeah. Uh, the welfare, the chief chief fraud investigator for the welfare department. Yeah. And uh, in the state of New Jersey, and he was, you know, his expert in, in forgery and all kinds of other things. And just the list of his credentials, you read this, and it's like, oh my gosh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, and and now you know now he says I saw Bigfoot and <laughs> you know so 
what do you say to a guy like that? <laughs> what do what do the skeptics say to a guy like that? Rather, you know, yeah, interesting. Yeah, well, he's refreshingly steadfast, like you say. David, he doesn't mm. give a damn if you believe him or not. He knows where he's seen, and as far as he's concerned, it's real. Yeah, and that's all the more impressive for me, because that's somebody who, you know, at least by all appearances, he doesn't have an agenda mm. uh, in terms of, you know, he's not trying to get a TV show, or he's not trying to, <laughs> you know, uh, do whatever. He's He's got a personal mission, so to speak, and he's... Uh, gathering what evidence he can, and you know, fortunately for the rest of us, he shares it. Yeah, yeah, very true, very true. Now, this next one is one of those that's one of those that's exploded since I was planning to do my do this show, David, and end up speaking to wonderful guests such as yourself. And I remember when I was doing my preparation and I was planning everything, this story broke, and I was like, "This is this is crazy." Casey Hathaway. A three-year-old child disappears Sorry. in the middle of winter. It's freezing out. Three days later, he's found by Park Services, I think, found him. And you think, well, fair enough, three-year-old kid. What a, what a wonderful story. He survived against the odds in these elements. However, the aspect of his story that made people sit up and take notice is the fact that he claims that he survived for three days in the wild because a bear looked after him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what do you make of that, David? Because I know some people have said, oh, well, he created a fantasy to help him survive. Um, which I find, once again, it's one of those kind of explanations where children go through traumatic events are all around the world, David. Um, there are numerous children that get lost hiking or in the mountains or in the woods in the States. I've never heard of another small child claim that a bear saved them. No, it's 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 a heck of a story, I, just all the way around. Uh, quite honestly, I mean, first of all, of course, the mere fact that he was found alive, mm. you know, is is remarkable. Mm. And uh, this occurred for people not familiar with the story. This occurred in January 2019, uh, so two years ago. And this boy was three years old. Uh, he went missing from his grandmother's home. And uh, he was he was with some other kids playing outside, and two the other two children uh, there were three of them total. So the other two children went inside. They left Casey outside, and um, when the grandmother discovers that he's not in the house, she goes out and, and starts calling for him and looking for him. And uh, a period of about Oh, I think 45 minutes or, or so elapses that the family itself is just searching for this boy. And then they call authorities uh, because clearly something's wrong at that point. And the local authorities, they really, uh, they, they kind of go all out on this one. They've got a, a helicopter that has heat seeking tech that, mm -hmm. you know, flying overhead looking for this boy. And as you stated, he is gone for two days mm -hmm. and at this point you know people are starting to think well maybe this is not going to turn out so good mm -hmm. uh, but January 24th a, a woman who's out walking her dogs uh, hears a little kid calling for his mother so she calls she dials 911 and uh, search team quickly arrives at the area and they are able the boy's still still calling out they're able to find him they locate his voice and he's caught in a, a bunch of thorns mm. in, in the woods so you know at this point this this kid is you know he's pretty kind of scratched up and, and of course you know and uh, clearly been in the woods for a couple of days yeah. and uh, he's, he's very cold and his core temperature is low uh, but the authorities taking him, they take him to the hospital, and they uh, they note that while this boy was gone, temperatures in the area had dropped as low as 17 degrees. Mm -hmm. This is a three-year-old kid. Yeah, you know there are a lot of mysteries here, regardless of how you want to approach it or understand it. His explanation was that he had not been alone while he was in the forest, mm -hmm. that he had, had had been hanging out with a bear. Yeah. And 
of course, you know, cryptozoologists that quickly looked at this and said, well, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> bear is not just going to take the kid in and <laughs> yes. you know, treat him to berries or something. Uh, you know, <laughs> what exactly happened here? Yeah. So it's, it's a, it is a fascinating story. I mean, even, you know, some authorities didn't know what to think of it. There was a, a, uh, one of the county, the county sheriff, um, in one of the interviews, you know, said, I don't know what this boy meant. You know, I don't know if he meant that a bear was actually there and, and was with him or if he just made it up. He said, but you know what? I'm going to embrace this story and uh, for what, you know, just for what he says it is and be thankful that the boy's alive. Mm -hmm. um, fast, fascinating account. And I think that... Um, you know, when you go back and, and look at various tales of, you know, purported human Bigfoot interaction, we really have to question, was there some other element involved here that was more than just a bear? Yeah, yeah. Like you say, though, David, even if you take away what Casey says, I, I can't understand how he survived at all. Right. Yeah, that's that's the puzzle, isn't it? And, uh, you know, you would think, well, if, if, you know, if we sort of go the other direction and say, well, let's, let's, hey, let's assume this kid was hanging out with a Bigfoot. Well, then he may have had shelter. You know, mm -hmm. He may have had uh, some warmth to a degree. Uh, we don't know. You know, maybe that's, maybe that's what happened. Maybe it was the, the Sasquatch that, uh, you know, got him back as close to his home as he could. Mm -hmm. Indeed. I mean, it's remarkable regardless. It's a remarkable story and a wonderful end because, like you say, unfortunately, often stories like that don't have a, a positive outcome for anybody involved. So reg right. regardless, right. it was heartwarming. And uh, I know the footage of, of the family being reunited is quite, uh, quite tear-jerking, actually. It's lovely to see. And, it, and it's about a half a mile from the from where he disappeared. Yes, exactly. And, <laughs> Which, and the, I mean... <laughs> well, that's the other aspect of this as well is, David... His family were shouting for him, yeah. looking for him. How far yeah. is a three-year-old going to go in 45 minutes? Exactly. In and winter. All the parties and everything else, you know, a half mile from his home. Yeah. It's, it's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot more to it. Like I say, even if you unpack the, the bear explanation, whatever the bear, Bigfoot, wherever it is, it's one Absolutely. of those stories that it, it, it just doesn't make, there's a lot of it that doesn't make sense, but thankfully everything turned out all right in the end. Absolutely. No, marvellous. Right, I can't let you go before we talk about <laughs> one of the wonderfully weird stories you manage to uncover, because every time you do one of these state books, David, you uncover a really weird story, and we were laughing before we started the interview proper about, we were talking about those very odd squids that, uh, <laughs> that turned up. And... Um, this time, you've got something else that seems a bit peculiar, which is the the weird story about the Cameron Village sewer blobs. And once again, a fairly recent story, isn't it? 2009. Yeah. Is when this one occurs. And yeah it's it's a it's a very bizarre, it's a very bizarre thing. You know, you you read this, and of course, there's. Uh, there's a whole different level to this one because it is so recent. You have a lot of media coverage. You have uh, some video. Uh, you have you know plenty of, of experts who have weighed in from uh, different directions, mm. but no explanation yeah. for what this is. And it, you know, it's almost. Uh, I liked writing this one up because, uh, as I said in in the as I said in the book, you know, this is almost like something from a 1950s yes. sci-fi movie <laughs> comic book because it, it's such a bizarre looking thing. Now this is, you know, you, you have to imagine this thing if you don't have an image of it in front of you. So we're talking about a blob that is, is kind of, you know, looks like raw meat. <laughs> it, it's, it's wet and it's kind of pulsating. And, you know, it gives you this sense that it's just waiting to leap forward or something, right, and, and kind of, you know, overwhelm you. Uh, and, and you just have to, you have to think <laughs> it's, a, you know, like leaving a slimy trail and making a, a really disgusting, you know, kind of sickening sound. Yeah. Uh, this is what was discovered in 
the village of uh, in the area of Cameron Village, which is uh, in Raleigh, hmm. and uh, this thing was discovered when a routine check was being done of the sewer system beneath Cameron Village. Uh, they were running cameras down. Uh, construction company was to see you know what kind of condition the system was in. Uh, a lot of lines had been built in the late 1940s. Hmm. So they were expecting, you know, uh, some some level of um, of wear and tear, and, and you know, just kind of inspecting to see what do we need to replace, and you know, how much work needs to be done here, and so forth. When they caught this bizarre thing on camera, and the video was released, of course, it caused kind of a frenzy because uh, <laughs> you know no one quite knew what to do with it. <laughs> you know, it appeared to be a living, breathing animal. Uh, there was quickly speculation on on what it might be. It's uh, suggestions that it was some kind of a slime mold. Uh, there were there were other experts that weighed weighed in and say, "Oh no, these are uh, sludge worms mm. that are are bound up in a cluster and uh, <laughs> people are sort of working together." Ultimately, this is one of those things that you know really no one seems to have settled on an explanation because I had two or three scientists that jumped in and said, no, it's this, no, it's that. And uh, they all argued with each other and said, well, that guy's yes. wrong because it's, it's, the, you know, it's a sludge <laughs> worm. And, you know, inevitably, in the midst of it, of course, you had uh, videos and stuff cropping up online saying it's, it's aliens, you know, or it's, um, it's toxic waste that has, uh, you know, become animated uh, <laughs> by radioactive uh, material. And, you know, the part of the fun in, in looking at some of these cases, I think, sometimes is, is just the explanations that people come up with to try <laughs> to try to figure out and to try to say that they've got the answer. But really, when it comes down to it, no one, no one specifically knows. And... Uh, the the story kind of fades away. Yeah. You know, just, people just stop talking about it, and you have to wonder, you know, what do the people in Cameron Village think <laughs> about what uh, what's oozing around below their homes? <laughs> yeah, I mean, as you touched on there, when I read this again, it's one of those. It's, it's one of those where I I'd come across it when it first broke because it's one of those where it gets shared every, everywhere and it was one of those videos that went mm -hmm. viral David and everybody as you refer to saying oh it's aliens they're here um, but it, as you touched on that it really did remind me of something from a 1950s sci-fi film you know like yeah. Quatermass or something like that yeah. <laughs> this strange creature lurking in the sewers um and it was funny to see how many scientists were very quick to point out that the other scientists didn't know what they were talking about. And and also, I think the lady who described it as being a slime mold essentially just then backed off and said, well, wh whatever it is, it's nothing to do with this council. OK, thanks right, a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not not our that, problem. Thank that's you. Not our department. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. That is passing the book in, in a fantastic <laughs> example, I think, David. Yeah, great story though. <laughs> wonderful wonderful well David it's a fantastic book Monsters of the Tar Heel State and a, another wonderful collection of legends and cryptids and witnesses from North Carolina to go with the preceding books where can everybody get hold of a copy and uh, what is next on your agenda sir well the book is available on Amazon.com of course uh, you can go to my website, EerieLights.com, and uh, there are links there also to all the books. Additionally, if you check, uh, I, I do occasionally, when I have time, put some uh, signed copies up on eBay uh, for people to snag. <laughs> and uh, the website, EerieLights.com, will have announcements of other projects and so forth. Uh, I just released a book oh, a few weeks ago called Haunted Prisons. Mm. That's part of the Haunted series that I write with co-author Ross Allison. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, uh, oh gosh, about three more books already in the pipeline. And in fact, uh, the next installment in the Cryptid State series is currently with uh, the editor, I think he's about wrapped up on it. So that one will be coming in fairly short order. And uh, I expect to be 
previewing the cover for that fairly soon, probably by the end of the month. So uh, I know everybody, you know, people are always asking me, what's what state is it? What state is it? And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'll just say that you'll, you'll have to wait, but I did find some fascinating legends once again to cover. Fantastic. And uh, a wonderful cover for Monsters of the Tar Heel State, as, as the whole collection seems to have with, by Sam Sheeran. So is Sam doing the cover for this one as well? He is indeed. Oh, fantastic. I look forward to seeing what, whichever creature has caught his eye then, David. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's brilliant. I was going to say, um, your books with Ross Allison I do enjoy as well. I know we've not really touched on them when we've spoken previously, but um, I got a copy of your Haunted Lighthouses for Christmas. Oh, yeah. Nice. Fantastic. Another another uh, captivating facet of the paranormal is things like that. So uh, uh, I'm, I've yet to get hold of the, the prisons one because that's a, a subject I'm very interested in as well. So I'll be uh, once again spending my hard-earned money on Amazon, no doubt, David. But um, <laughs> thank you as always for your time. It's a real pleasure. Uh, thank you for making time for me as always. You're always very kind and considerate in arranging to speak with me. I will look forward to the new book and I know for a fact we're probably going to talk about that in the next few months. It's always good to chat with you, my friend. Take care. Okay, you too.